Hey, future respiratory therapist, respiratory coach here coming at you. We got the week of Thanksgiving going on, so I'm going to try to get a lot of questions answered while I have this break from school. And I hope you too have a break from school. And if you're working as a respiratory therapist, I hope you're having a phenomenal time doing so. So today's topic is over occlusion pressure. This comes from Isaac, who wants to know more about the P.1 or the P100, also known as the occlusion pressure in implementing it into or being part of a spontaneous breathing trial. That's a phenomenal thought process because this measurement actually a lot of times is in reference to weaning success. So when we say occlusion pressure, we're talking about the pressure and inspiratory pressure at 0.1 seconds or you'll also see it referred to as the P100 and this is milliseconds. Okay, so we're talking about the the inspiratory pressure generated within the first 100 milliseconds of the central drive to breathe saying, take a breath. The first 100 milliseconds. Now, this is important because this is before the window or the inspiratory valve of the ventilator ever even recognizes a breath or initiates a breath. Opens, in other words. Okay, the other thing... The reason this is important is because it's a great indicator of a patient's central respiratory drive. So remember, the central drive to breathe is proportionally related to CO2. So if you have a patient with a high CO2, then from the central respiratory center drive to breathe level, you're going to have an increased drive to breathe. Now, when you think about this, When you're talking about getting patients off the ventilator, you want them to have a a normal drive to breathe, but do you want them to have an increased drive to breathe? The answer is probably not, right? The last thing you want to do is take an endotracheal tube away from a patient, and then they're stuck with this high central drive to breathe, and they can't meet that need. You're almost destined to... Um, find yourself in an impending ventilatory failure situation. And so this is where this value comes into play. Now, normal values for the occlusion pressure, normal equals approximately one all the way up to approximately 3.5. This is centimeters of water pressure. And these are negative numbers, obviously, because we're talking about inspiratory pressures. When you talk about inspiratory pressures, you have to understand you're talking about the diaphragm drops, the respiratory muscles contract, and you get a negative intrathoracic creation of of negative intrathoracic pressure, right? So these are negative values. These are just like the MIP or the NIF, except for when you're talking about maximum inspiratory pressure and MIP You're looking at conscious efforts. You're telling the patient, suck in as hard as you can, and you want to see how hard they can generate, how much negative pull they can generate from their diaphragm and their respiratory muscles. Now, that's more common of a weaning indicator traditionally. This value was actually first proposed back in 1975, and here we are, what? 25, almost 45 years later, actually thinking now, what's the value of this pressure? Some of you may be using this already. Here in my area of practice, it's occasionally thought about, but it's not a routine portion of our spontaneous breathing trials or even used during mechanical ventilation, which I found that this actually has value beyond an SBT. So let's break it down. Let's talk about it like this. Normal is 1 to 3.5. If you have greater than 3.5, it equals an increase central drive to breathe. Okay? If it's less than, what I say, 0.5 to 1, then it's a decreased respiratory drive to breathe. Now this is important because if you do an occlusion pressure on a patient who's receiving mechanical ventilation and you want to see if they're ready to to wean or do you want to do an SBT and you do an occlusion pressure and you find that it's that it's, you know, 0.1 
then they're not probably not going to have a real successful level during their spontaneous breathing trial because their central drive to breathe is, is, is minimal. So this may be related to either low CO2 levels or it may be related to too much sedation is on board or a paralyzing a uh, paralyzing agent is on board so that the, the respiratory muscles in the diaphragm are not able to generate that initial negative pull. So you always want you want to assess this and it can be helpful in determining when we're when we're when our patients have a reduction in a central drive to breathe, which is also important. You don't want to extubate somebody with a reduced drive to breathe. You're definitely going to be reintubating that patient, right? If it's greater than 3.5, it can be an indication of an increase in a patient's central drive to breathe, even if they're on full mechanical ventilation, which is also a problem because how cruel is it, as I've said before, to intubate somebody, initiate mechanical ventilation, and then not satisfy their drive to breathe. This is, this is not a, a conscious thought of us as respiratory therapists say, hey, we're going to make you put you at ease and take away your drive to breathe. We typically intubate going, oh my gosh, their CO2s are really high, their O2s are really low, we got to fix their blood gases. But what about fixing the patient? What about fixing their drive to breathe? This patient with an increased occlusion pressure may need more sedation or maybe the vent settings aren't set correctly to satisfy this person's central respiratory drive to breathe. Okay, Now that's during mechanical ventilation and assessing uh, the occlusion pressure, not just during a spontaneous breathing trial. Now I'm going to erase this because when we're talking about uh, SBTs or spontaneous breathing trials, I want to talk to you a little bit about the occlusion pressure and its value. Okay, If a patient has an increased central respiratory drive to breathe, then it can be an indication of, like I said, impending ventilatory failure yet to come when you extubate. It could also be an indication of muscle fatigue. So let me give you an example here, okay? Now I'm gonna take this back a step. I'm gonna go back to, to I'm gonna take this off the board here, and we're gonna talk more about, I'm gonna put P100 up here, and I'm gonna put MIP here. So what we find here is that we typically, a lot of us, use MIP as an indicator of readiness to wean. There's a lots of things out there. RSBI, vital capacity, can you lift your head up off the bed? You know, um, various things of, of different nature, right? Some of us are already using the P100, which is good. But what I'm going to challenge you with today is this ratio of the P100 to the maximum inspiratory pressure. Because what you're going to find here is this is a, 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 a something that is fairly new from what I'm aware of coming out in some research studies where they're saying, hey, the P100 is a good indicator of the central drive to breathe. If it's within normal values, it's a good indicator of winning success. The MIP has always been a decent indicator of winning success in conjunction with other values, right? But what if, they're, what if, what if we put them together? Is there something in line that says that a ratio between the two might be helpful? So I'm going to put some numbers up here, right? If you have, let's say you have a patient who has a P100 of 1.5, which is normal, and a MIP of, of 50, okay? Well, when we do this math, obviously this person looks like they have a normal central drive to breathe, and they have a normal maximum inspiratory pressure. No, not normal. I'm sorry. 80 would be normal. More negative than negative 80 is normal. So 50 is, is not what we would call normal, but it's an acceptable range. It's greater than 20 or more negative than negative 20, correct? So when we do this, we find that we have a ratio of 1.5 divided by 50. So this is the... P100 to MIP ratio, okay? Now for this one, we have 0 0.03, which is 3%. Now that sounds good, right? And it is, okay? Let's take another patient. So this patient looks positive for 
predictor of winning success. Looks like they're gonna gonna successfully win. If these are the only two numbers we're looking at, of course, if their RSBI is 300, then this doesn't come into count, right? But if everything else is good and we have these values, then 3% looks nice, okay? When we look at a patient who has a MIP of negative, let's just say 25, and let me give you another one here of 30. Now, both of these patients, according to their MIP, which we know are negative values, I've been reading some stuff here that says you don't have to refer to these as negative values because it's already implied it's a negative value. If you're talking about a negative inspiratory force, then you don't have to state it as a negative 20. You can just say 20 because it's already stated that it's a negative number. If you have a talk about negative, uh, uh, a maximum inspiratory pressure, we already know this is going to be a negative number because we're talking about the maximum amount of negative pressure that a patient can generate when asked to, okay? Which is the key difference between the P100 and the MIP. When you instruct somebody to do a MIP, you say, hey, I want you to blow all your air out to RV. You don't tell them that, but that's what you're doing. Blow all your air out till you can't blow out anymore. Now suck in for me as hard as you can. The patient is consciously generating a negative pull and it's a direct indication of respiratory muscle and diaphragmatic strength right now when you do the p100 you want to know subconsciously what is the patient's respiratory drive so you would not instruct this patient to perform what we do as a MIP. You wouldn't say, hey, real fast, suck in real hard for me because you're going to alter this number. You're probably going to get a larger number. And remember, when we're talking about the P100, the occlusion pressure, the larger the number, the larger the increased respiratory drive to breathe is, which is not what we want. We want a normal drive to breathe. We don't want an increased drive to breathe. So, so you're going to get a false number that's high because you instructed the patient. All research says that the P100 or the P.1 or the occlusion pressure should be done in a noise-free environment without instructions. You want to see what the patient is doing subconsciously. And this is your best indicator of their drive to breathe in response to their need to eliminate CO2. So if we have two, two, two patients here, we would all agree that both of them have acceptable NIFs, right? Now, this person with a negative with a 25 MIP has a P100 of 1.5. Okay, let's change it just a little bit. Let's say they have a P100 of of two. Okay. Now, when we look at this. You would say this is good. You would say, okay, we're barely, we're, we're, we're more negative than negative 20. So I think the patient's good. If we choose and look at this ratio, the P100 to the MIP, then what we see is 2 divided by 25 equals 8%. Okay, now we're going to talk about normal values on this here in just a second. So this one is 8%, right? Now when we look at this third one, let's say that this third one has a NIF or a MIP of 30. And let's say their P100 is 7.5. So they have an increased occlusion pressure, which means this being elevated means they have an increased work of breathe an increased respiratory drive the brain is saying breathe and breathe hard right so when we look at this look what we get we get 7.5 divided by 30 equals 25 percent now in the real world let's say everything else checked out good we would probably extubate both of these patients. This one has a NIF of negative, a MIP of negative of 25. I have a tendency to say NIF. It's just my old school part of me. But the MIP is 25. This MIP is 30. Both of these MIPs are acceptable. Neither of them are, are, are staggering. Neither of them are like, oh my gosh, this is so good, right? But they're both acceptable. If everything else checked out and we didn't look at anything else, we would extubate both of these patients. Now, what we find when if we had assessed the occlusion pressure, the P100, 
or the P0.1 second, what we would find is, is that this patient subconsciously behind the scenes has an increased central drive to breathe, which means we're going to take away ventilatory support. 7.5 related to 30 is 25%. And this patient would be at a higher risk for impending ventilatory failure post-extubation than what you would find from this patient, 8%. Now, what's the cutoff mark for this? Nobody knows. There's been no data that supports or shows what this cutoff, what this cutoff point is, okay? Things, I've seen numbers around less than 15% is a positive indicator. I've seen things that have said, you know, you know, less than 10%. Really what you don't want is 25%. I think greater than 20% from the things I've been looking at is an indicator of, or a high indicator that this person is not ready to be extubated or for the removal of mechanical ventilation because of their high central respiratory drive to breathe. Okay. That's what I got for you. Okay. I hope this makes sense. I hope, um, I hope it helps bring some things home. You can always, uh, Google search, uh, occlusion pressure or P100 or P.1 and you will find, uh, these research, uh, projects that are going on right now that are addressing some of these concerns to try to bring this factor that was first talked about in 1975 back to the table to say, are we missing something here? And this is what it's all about, guys. Are we missing something? Is this important? When you don't know any of this and you just extubate this one and extubate this one and then you scratch your head going, well, why did this patient fail with a better MIP than this patient? Well, it's because we're not adept to identifying central drive to breathe and we're not taking it into account for the formula. So start thinking about it, guys. Put it into play at your hospital setting. Put it to play. See what happens. When you extubate somebody, whether you chart it or not, perform an occlusion pressure maneuver. Most ventilators have... You can go in and actually perform a maneuver that will give you the P0.1 or the P100. Perform it and then put it and compare it to your MIP and see what your percentage is and then extubate them and see what you get for yourself. It'll just be interesting to see. So anyways, I hope this helps, Isaac. I know you got another question about SIMV+. Plus. I'm going to get that video out here to you real soon. I appreciate you asking the questions. Hey, guys, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so now. Leave a comment in the questions below. Like the video if you enjoyed it. If you didn't, don't like it or dislike it. Put a question up there. Tell me how you're using occlusion pressure in your facility. I'd love to hear from more people who are using it on a daily basis. Best wishes.